three, two, one. All right, another episode of No Foreplay. Clint Campbell from the Truth From The Stand podcast is back on the show today. And what are we talking about today, man? Today, man, what I was thinking of, and I've been thinking of this quite a bit um, recently, mm -hmm. is first it started off, I was thinking of whether or not to stop deer when you're about to make that shot, right? Do you mm -hmm. stop them? Do you let them walk? Like, what are those kind of situations or circumstances you do that? And then, you know, and then at the same time, thinking of shot placement and where this kind of came from was um, I'm getting ready to get purchase a, a uh, longbow and start mm -hmm not forcing myself but legitimately making that transition from a compound to traditional equipment and you know we'll right. see how quickly that transition happens and that's really what got me kind of thinking about it because this past year both you know bucks that i shot i shot through the shoulder you know and one was a you know a 10 ring one a heart shot through the shoulder and then the other one was that one in kansas that it went through both shoulders and it just started making me made me stop and think like making this transition specifically because I want to, I want to kill a buck on the ground in the plain States with traditional equipment. It's kind of the reason right. why, but that hunt specifically made me start to kind of think just about my shot placement there. Cause it was, you know, I couldn't have shot that buck any better, but it was through both shoulders and knowing that I have a shorter draw length moving to traditional equipment, not quite as much ass behind it made me start to think about, I might need to start thinking about my placement a little bit differently. Yeah. 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 Great topic. Shot placement. Um, let, let's just, let's just continue the, the gear or the, the method in which we are trying to harvest these deer. Um, I, I really do think like the, let's just start with archery, right? Mm -hmm. Um, with archery equipment, a compound bow with a well-weighted arrow is going to do a lot of damage, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, 70 pounds, you know, and kudos to the guys who are pulling, you know, 80 pounds and plus my shoulders yeah. couldn't take, couldn't take that. But, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be as concerned. I'm trying to put myself in the traditional archer's shoes because I think that for them, it would mean you would have to think more on shot placement than I would with my compound tackle because I really, dude, this is going to sound bad, but I'm a, I go into kill mode. I'll take frontals. I'll take hard quartering. I'll take uh hard quartering towards, you know, never, never in the ass or, you know, right. straight away. But if a deer is within shooting range, especially if it's inside 15 yards, more than likely it's getting an arrow. I mean, it would have to be in some thick stuff and it somehow made its way into me without walking away uh, and walking away from me straight on where the only option would be like the back of the head or in the neck, right? right. I've also taken a shot where the deer is coming out of a crick bed and it was walking up the opposite side hill at 30 yards. And so you could see it's, I mean, it's spine went right down the middle and I took a shot at that because he was vertical, right? Mm -hmm. It was almost like he was standing on his hind legs, but he was up. So he was, he was walking away from me, but all of his vitals were still right there. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he stopped, he turned his head, he looked and uh, I hit a branch. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether or not it would have been a good shot. I hit a branch, the arrow went sailing. Um, let's kind of walk through what you would do in a scenario where you have traditional archery and a deer is coming in. Like I, I hear guys saying that, you know, for me, it's probably 60 yards with a compound. Mm -hmm. What do you feel would be the ideal or the, the maximum range for traditional archery? Man. I mean, for me, just being a newbie, like I, I'm going to be hopeful that by the time that I get to the point that I'm going to actually start using it, cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into the, the timber with it until I feel confident with it. Right. 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 And I want my, you know, effective range to be 20 yards. Like if I can get yep. to 20 yards, like I will feel pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, my opportunities. Now there's some guys that can shoot well beyond that. And maybe if I, 
I practice enough and I spend enough time with it for a couple of years or whatever, maybe I can get to that point. But mm -hmm. I would be super stoked if I was, if I, if I was as confident with a traditional bow out to 20 yards as I am with my compound out to say 40, you know, if I yeah. can, if I can do that, then I think I'd, I'd feel pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, now with, with a compound bow, what's the, what's the max you're taking? as far as yardage is concerned. <laughs> yeah, I mean if like in Kansas, like just because like it's it's open, right? I always mm -hmm. kind of said there would that would probably be the longest shot I would take would be in a plant whether it's Kansas, Nebraska, just like open area, like I guess mm -hmm. is a better way to say it. You know, I was prepared to take, you know, a 50-yard shot probably if the opportunity presented itself and I'm I'm talking, you know, I don't have 30 mile per hour crosswind, you know what right. I mean? The right. animal's relaxed, you know, and it's not, you know, I'm not worried about it taking off whenever I release the arrow or, or something like that. Right? right. That would probably be the max. Um, it, it just around here in PA, just the areas I hunt. I don't think I've ever shot a deer in this area or in PA that was any further than 20 yards away. I don't think, yeah. um, yeah just based on how thick a lot of the places are that I, that I, that I hunt. So that there's just to kind of frame, you know, how, what my distances yeah. are based on a, uh, based on the terrain. Yeah. Okay. So usually, and I'm not saying every time, but usually when you start talking into this trad, um, this trad, uh, type of equipment, you're talking about really heavy FOC and really heavy total arrow weight in general. Okay, mm -hmm. so that means a slower and uh, arrow, more momentum, however, and um, and so do you think that traditional archers have to take different shot angles in order to eff uh, effectively kill uh, a, a big game species like a whitetail or mule deer or elk? I don't know about shot angle, but I definitely think they have to like you you got to be pretty good with your gapping right or like mm -hmm. just understanding like the flight of your arrow and there's a bunch of different ways to shoot you know whether you're you know whether you're aiming or you shoot you know uh more instinctively or or whatever mm -hmm. the case is but it's just being able to know where that arrow is ultimately going to going to land i mm -hmm. think for me like when we start talking shot angles like and just in talking to a buddy of mine last night we were kind of chopping it up about it he was actually saying one of the hardest ways for someone moving from compound to traditional one of the most challenging things to do is to actually use it in a saddle one just mm -hmm. especially that you know offside or a weak side shot but two from an elevated setup when they get really close mm -hmm. you know he's like the mistake that a lot of people will make is they constantly practice that 20 yard shot he's like that's actually like the easiest shot you're going to get with traditional equipment you know because it's just it's longer a little bit more to deal with in the in the tree He's like the tough shot is is that they get, you know, ten yards and in, and they're right on top of you. Even with a compound, like that's a tough shot because it's such a high angle or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And you have to think about, you know, you're not shooting this bow up and down usually, like you kind of cant it to the side. Some folks do, you know. So there's just a lot mm -hmm. more that kind of goes into it. And he was like, "That's the shot that you want to spend time with, because yeah. that's the one that you end up watching." a target buck walk away from you because you just can't get comfortable to take that shot because it's awkward for you. Right. You know? And so I think you definitely have to take it into consideration. I think what would probably where I would probably, I don't want to say stumble, but what I think will be challenging for me is just knowing when I have a good shot presented. Right. Cause now yeah. to your point earlier, like with my compound, like, man, I feel as long as I can see something that will kill it, <laughs> I feel pretty good that I can, that I can make that shot, you know? Yeah. Um, and then that, you know, and that for me, at least this isn't for everybody. Yeah. Like I'm sure there's guys out there that are super like way more confident in their traditional equipment than, than I probably ever will be. Um, but I'm looking more for that, like classic, like, man, I want to see, yeah, I want to see lungs. I want to try to get double lungs, you know, just, it would make me feel a lot more comfortable. And it's probably part of it is just, you know, being new and, having a learning curve to to get confident and know what my equipment can do and what it what it can't do right right all right so that's the trad side of things um right. let's talk a little bit about um the the compound right you got your compound in the tree is there any shot that you won't take first of mm -hmm. first of all 
I think what you were saying earlier, just the one that I've absolutely won't take is like when they're facing away from me, you know, I've, I mean, I'm not telling any tales out of school here. I mean, I think we all love that, that slightly quartering away shot, right. That gets Mm -hmm. your head, their head away from you a little bit, gives you an opportunity to draw potentially. Right. And then you stick it in that back rib and you basically take everything with it. You know, that's like the, the money shot, you know, I, the only one that I'm always hesitant to is the is the frontal. Like I've never taken a frontal shot. I've never been presented a shot on an animal that I wanted to kill. That that yeah. was the only shot. The only shot that it gave me. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. and this year, you know, gave me a lot of confidence just in my setup that I have to be able to take, you know, tough shots. You know, where it's right. like I'm dealing with shoulder bone and stuff like that. And I think it also depends on the the critter you're chasing. Now with my draw length and stuff like that. I would not take the shot that I took on the the whitetail in Kansas if it were an elk. I'll put it that way, right? Yeah. I just wouldn't be confident that I have enough ass in my setup, you know, to yeah. to get the job done there. Um, but on whitetails, you know, other than the frontal and even that one, like I feel like if it was close enough range, I feel like I I feel like I would stick it in the inside of that pocket and let it rip. Yeah, I've had uh, my twenty twenty one buck was the perfect frontal shot uh buried it i didn't hit his heart and i didn't hit any lungs believe it or not i hit right in the middle where the heart all those arteries and valves um connect to the lung and it went right in there just switch cheesed it Mm -hmm. and when i was gutting the deer the heart pretty much just rolled out without me having to pull it. It was, it was a beautiful thing and it hopped, it did a bounce, bounce, fall over dead. Right. And so, but that was at 10 yards. Am I taking a frontal at 30? No, absolutely not. Right. 20. If he's, if he's calm, maybe if his head's up, maybe he's at, uh, I don't know, a scenario would be, he's at a licking branch or something, Mm -hmm. but here's one thing that I've noticed. And I think a lot of, how you shoot deer depends on how you set up in the timber on like on in, within the terrain hear me out once and i want to hear your thoughts on this mm-hmm. i hear guys talk about setting up away from trails like okay well here's a scrape i want to set up away from it or here is a a main trail on this terrain feature so i want to set up on the downwind side away from it and hopefully catch them coming in broadside I don't like, I, I personally don't do that. I set up on the trail. I set up as close to where I think the deer is going to be as humanly possible. And so I think that actually has a lot to do with how I've taught myself to shoot deer with a frontal or a quartering towards, or maybe even a, maybe it, it sneaks through one shooting lane i wasn't prepared for it and now he's still close but he's quartering quartering towards or i'm shooting down at him instead of uh uh, you know completely broadside like this year this year was strange this year my buck was at 20 25 ish yards double lunged him watched him fall over dead um but every other deer for the most part that i've had has been inside 25 yards has been extremely close to me and I've, I've, I have not taken that, that, um, typical broadside shot on these deer mm-hmm. and right? I'm killing them with liver shots, quartering into backside lung, um, or even hitting forward on that same angle, hitting front, uh, front side lung and maybe coming out the neck and hitting uh, an artery in the neck, ble- bleeding to death. Um, I have found back in, uh, in my day, dude, you shoot a deer in the lungs, they're going to kick and they're going to run as fast as they can. You hit a deer in the liver, they're going to hunch and they're going to walk slowly away. Right. Hmm. And so I've, I've, I've had deer react to, uh, getting shot in the liver by falling over and dying in like, I don't know, 40 seconds. I've had double lungs fall over dead in 40 seconds. I got to tell the story. My stepdad, oh man, this was a long time ago. We were both sitting in the same fence line. He double lunged a buck and we tracked it for one mile. Hmm. 
super soaker blood trail. I mm-hmm. mean, it was it was like someone was dumping pop out of it, and it took it that long to die. Crazy, one of a right. one a one of one type uh, story. And so, when it comes to where you're aiming, or, or do you think where you set up and how you set up in a terrain feature or within that landscape plays a role in how what what shot you are willing to take yeah i I think it totally does because i set up differently depending on what's around me essentially right Mm -hmm. so if i can have it the way i absolutely want it is i want to set up to where i'm always taking like if i'm in my saddle it's like i'm always taking a strong side shot so i'm always shooting Mm -hmm. off the off to my left and it's just you know Classic deer hunting 101 is that I want to set up to where there's something behind me or to my right that where deer can't get to that side of me. So I'm forcing the deer right. to come to where I kind of, you know, want them to. But without that, even if there's, if it's an area that I can see well, like, so just, mm-hmm. just use a destination spot because I like to hunt scrapes, right? So let's just use a scrape as an example, like a community scrape. If I can see around that scrape, let's just say 15 yards in like any direction around that scrape, then I'm going to hunt probably on top of the scrape and I'm probably going to plan to shoot the deer before it ever gets there. Right. right. I'm just using that as right. like the center of the hub. And like he, you know, a lot of times he's, you know, you know, as well as I do, these bucks will take like these off shoot trails that aren't super defined and they won't come directly mm-hmm. into a scrape and just kind of stay off of them a little bit. And so I'm going to position myself at the scrape kind of right because then i know that i have an opportunity probably anywhere around it within within reason right yeah if it's an area that i that there's not a lot of room around it then i'm likely going to set up off of it because that one spot is probably the only opportunity that i'll have in terms of like a clear shot opportunity and so then i want the space between me and them that way i have a little bit you know, better opportunity to draw, stay concealed a little bit better and to have just a little bit better of an angle for, for the shot. Yeah. Right. And so those are kind of the two ways I think of, especially if I'm setting up on a destination spot, you know, if I can see around me, then I have a lot of opportunities and then I want to be on the spot because I want all the opportunities. If I can't see around me very well, then I want to be off the spot because that spot is probably going to be the, the one or two, the one of two places maybe that I'm going to have a shot opportunity. Right. Right. Let's say a deer standing 20 yards broadside, you have your compound. Are you the kind of guy who's going to tuck it right in behind the shoulder or are you giving yourself a little room for error? So this is, it's it's funny you ask this question because this is literally one of the things I was thinking about as I've been kind of thinking about making that, you know, uh, transition Mm -hmm. to traditional. I'm a tuck it in the pocket kind of guy. Like I hug, I hug the shoulder. Hence, You know, the last two bucks I shot, I, I shot through shoulders, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it's because I'm not taking long shots either. And I'm pretty confident in my setup. Yeah. So if I hit shoulder bone, like I'm not too worried about it. You know, I feel yeah. like I can, I'll make it through it and, and, and I'll be fine. Yeah. I'm having to kind of, you know, I was literally thinking to myself last night after I got kind of, you know, done talking to my buddy, I was like, man, I was like this year, whenever I'm practicing with that, I was like, I need to start making sure that I am you know, focusing probably more on margin of error and going more center vital mass, Mm -hmm. you know, and giving myself Mm -hmm. like two to three inches on the left, two to three inches on the right, you know, one, you know, two inches up, two inches down, you know, to be able to play with because I'm just probably not going to have the setup that's going to, you know, do what my current setup is doing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Especially when you're a new, you know, new into trad, you know, like for me, I, I used to be the guy who was like, oh, because everything I I had learned about archery was here's the heart, here's what you should aim for, and obviously the heart is a smaller target than the lungs are, and so over the years, like I've missed, I've completely missed deer low because I I was aiming for the heart, and everything that I had read up until a certain point was like deer are going to drop when they hear your bow go off. Mm-hmm. Well, if they don't drop or, or they're really close and they drop afterwards, it doesn't matter, right? You you, right. you miss, you missed. And so since then, since I, I kind of, you know, I've had some liver shots and I know that uh, the liver is a deadly shot. If you hit the liver solid, that deer will die, mm-hmm. right? 
And so, and, it, and more than likely, they're going to die very fairly quickly, and because that what, the liver bleeds really bad. You hit the lungs, they're going to die. You hit the heart, they're going to die. Um, and so, I now, knowing that I've seen and had having the experience with liver shots, I've come off that shoulder probably four inches, and I'm aiming for a double lung. But then I know if I miss, like what you said. If I miss four inches to the right, there's still a chance I hit back lung or I hit liver. If I'm missing forward, I'm still in that shoulder pocket and I'm, mm -hmm. you know, front side lung, potentially hard if it's low. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I've also dealt with high shots too. And so in the past, I've, you know, like I've hit backstrap on, mm -hmm. uh, and several years ago, I hit a, a deer backstrap or I've actually hit a deer below the spine. And it went through, like it, it went, it must've went below the spine on this inch or whatever that is, because usually the lungs come right up into the, I hit a deer there, never found him. And he yeah. came back the next year. And so whatever, uh, right. I, I was baffled that I didn't kill that buck anyway. Yeah. Um, so that's why I, I don't, I don't shoot the pocket anymore. I, I come off of it knowing that I have a margin of error. There was one guy, I forget his name, but he always used to say, he says, shoot him in the middle, find him in the morning. And I'm just like, no, I, I want to watch, I want to watch them die in sight. That's right. the goal. So, right. That's hilarious, man. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like, I definitely am a hug the shoulder guy, uh, from yeah. the left and right, but for my up and down, I'm center up and down. Like I don't, I don't, I don't play the drop. I never really no. have like I, when I, I shoot a single pin and what, what the way I've set it up is I think it's like rough. I think it's 26 yards is where I have it set. And I know at 26 yards, if I'm shooting out the 30, I have about a three inch drop at 30 yards. Right. So I know if I'm shooting out the 30 yards from a tree and I have a deer that's going to drop and I'm holding it center mass, even if I'm hug, hugging the shoulder, if they drop, I have three inches up, it, up yeah. basically up and down that I can play with, right? And so if I'm hitting, you know, if I sh hold it center mass, I'm going to yeah. shoot three inches low at 30 yards. I'm going to still be in the bottom of the vitals if they don't drop. If they do yeah. drop, I'm probably going to be, you know, top of the lungs and still be, still be a kill shot, right? And yeah. then when they come in and they're under roughly like 15 yards or so, I'm going to naturally shoot a little bit high. And, and whenever you're at that funky angle, right? you want you want to shoot just a little bit high right because you want that exit wound right yep. and and so it kind of takes all the guesswork out for me as to where i'm going to hold up and down based on the yardage so i know if a 26 yard pin i'm good from 30 to right up on my business mm -hmm. you know in terms of holding it center up and down now my left yeah. and right i always try to hug the pocket but up and down i don't ever have to calibrate it's always the same up and down yeah that makes a lot of sense all right uh Deer comes in and he's whether he's chasing a doe or he's on a mission or he's coming through and you, he doesn't look like he's going to stop. What's your what's your stop strategy? Yeah, so I'm typically a I'm typically a stop the deer, um, mm -hmm. probably just just out of habit. It, which I say that in the Kansas buck this year, I stopped the Pennsylvania buck. I did not. Okay, you know so. But it was a little bit different scenario. The one in PA was, you know, October 16th. So he was just straight chilling, milling about, doing a little mm -hmm. browsing as he was, you know, probably late getting back to bed that morning. And, you know, not not a care in the world, right? And then yeah. the Kansas one was November 7th that had two does around, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I'm typically, if I can shoot them without me letting them know I'm there, that's kind of what I'm for. Yeah. If they're with other deer, and I don't, and they're moving around and I can't predict kind of what they're doing or they don't give me a, a real good kind of indication of like their specific line of travel that they're going to be consistent with that I can mm -hmm. shoot them on. Then it's, then I'm going to stop them, you know, and, and, and just give myself the best opportunity to, to have my pin where I want it and, and let it rip. So that's kind of my, my approach. I mean, I think it's, it's always a crap shoot. So I, I don't ever say I stop all the deer or let all the deer walk. It just kind of depends on, on the scenario. Yeah, man, that's a, I always think stopping deer, it's, I feel it's a necessity to do it, but if I can get in, 
if I can get a deer to naturally stop, mm -hmm. then, then I, I'm going to take that shot. You know, mm -hmm. let's say all things, all things considered, he's within my shooting range and he stopped, he comes in and he slows down and stops and I, you know, let the arrow go and he takes a step forward. I'm still hitting a little back long. I'm hitting some, you know, this is if he's broadside. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've also had the scenario happen where we talked about, you know, now I'm four inches off the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I am dead center up down and the deer, uh, 2016, as a matter of fact, I stopped the deer cause he was, I, uh, I grunted. He was going to walk out in this field. He took a hard left right towards me and he was, he was coming to investigate the grunt. And he saw deer out in the other field because I was uh, hunting on a fence corner crossing. And he came through uh, 20, let's just say 20 yards. I went back. He got tense. I put the arrow right where I thought it was going to go. He dropped when he heard the arrow go off and I spined him. Luckily, I spined him. He fell down. I put another arrow in him. It's over. But right. But that was a scenario where if he would have dropped a little bit further or if it was, let's say, 25, 30 yards and there was more reaction time, shit, that could have hit backstrap. It could have hit, I could have missed high on him. And I, watching these studies or if you go to YouTube and seeing how far a deer can actually drop, especially if they're usually the impressive ones or when their head is down mm -hmm. feeding, yeah. that's if their head's up, then they, they can't react as much, mm -hmm. which is, which is something that is very important when watching uh, a deer's body language is very important. Are they spooked or are they just curious, right? Yeah. Are they, are they naturally moving through? Um, did you just rattle? Are they coming in frantic searching? Like a lot, of, I feel a lot of that plays a, a role in whether or not you stop them. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. I think it's, you know, time of year for me is, is important mm -hmm. as far as like whether yeah. or not I think I'm going to have to stop a deer or whether mm -hmm. I would be willing to or not. Right. And distance makes a big difference. So I said, you know, the one in PA, you know, I didn't stop. I, I shot him walking, you know, and when I say walking, like he was barely walking, you know what yeah. I mean? Yep. But that shot was also 12 yards. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, even if he did take a step, chances of it being any more than like a half inch to an inch, back from where I was holding my pin, not, a, not a big deal. Right. Yeah. You know, the one in Kansas, you know, 27 yards, you know, little, little bit different. Like I probably, even if you were walking slow and it's just say it was October and he was by himself, you know, mid October and he was by himself, I'm probably still stopping him at that distance. Yeah. You know, but I like the element of surprise anytime I, anytime I can get it. And that's one thing I've been kind of thinking about again with, considering making that transition to traditional equipment, knowing that, man, I'm going to go from shooting short draw length. Right. So my, I probably shoot two sixty, F, you know, feet per second is probably what my, mm -hmm. my bow is roughly mm -hmm. give or take. Um, yeah. and I'm probably going to shoot like a 160 to 180 <laughs> yeah. with a traditional bow, you know what I mean? Depending yeah. on the setup and, and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah. you know, I have to, I'm starting to take all this stuff into consideration because I'm not gonna the game's changed. The game. I mean, it's it, yeah. it's a complete game changer. You know, like you got to yeah. relearn everything. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. now I'm like, you know, talking to buddies and be like, do you stop deer? Do you not stop deer? When do you stop yeah. them? You know, yeah. Because and I'm watching videos of guys like hunts of guys using traditional equipment and watching and paying attention. Like, did they stop that deer? Did they not stop that deer? How far was that? Like trying to figure out, like you know, just in watching guys in actual environment make those decisions and what are they and what are they doing? You know. Yeah. Um, so I got a lot to learn. Isn't it crazy how some of us are like, so I got to bring this up. I'm right in the middle, right? I, I have cell cameras. I, you know, they send me pictures. I know where deer are at, all that stuff. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I also, at some point am going to go trad. And because I, I just feel like it's for a serious hunter, it's like playing a badass card. Oh, you shot that deer. That's an awesome buck. Oh, you shot it with a trad bow. Kudos, dude. You know, like, <laughs> right. you know, uh, it's just, it's, 
you know, like it's the story, right? It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you shot it with a gun. Oh, okay. You shot it with a bow. Oh, cool. You shot that with a trad bow. Holy shit, dude. You know, like right. the story just seems to get better. And I'm all about yeah. like the stories. And so, yeah. uh, I don't know, man, it, everybody wants things to get easier. And I'm kind of, uh, you know, in some way, shape or form, I, I do that with like the Ozonics and I do that mm -hmm. with the hunting, the, uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ, the, the, uh, cell cams there you go <laughs> the cell cams <laughs> is that brain we talked about earlier that brain yeah. fog and right. uh and then also wanting to go do something harder which is trad on public right because that's yeah. another trump you know when it when it comes right. to storytelling you did it on private cool but if you did it on public then you're like oh my god that's an amazing story so right. um, yeah it's it's funny man because for me it's like i i so my dad when he did bow hunt uh, he only ever hunted with the, with a recurve when I was growing up yeah. and, you know, and that the first year I ever bow hunted, I hunted with a recurve yeah. and, you know, which was, was probably one of the dumbest things I ever did, but yeah. it, it probably, I should have just stuck with it. Right. Cause like that mm -hmm. first season with that bow was really rough. And that was when I was like, I was like, all right, I'm going to switch to a compound because I was like, I'll, this is just gonna, it probably would have ruined me. And I probably would have stopped at one, at some point because yeah. it just was, was that hard. And I, probably and i wasn't good enough yet right i wasn't yeah. a skilled enough hunter to to make it to make my equipment make it more challenging for me i'm just yeah. at a place now where you know i want the uh i want the connectivity to my body like i want to yeah. feel like i'm i'm in control of all of it you know yeah. um and that's really you know what i'm i think what i'm chasing is probably more that spiritual yeah you know element of it being connected being more primitive and you know and just experiencing that i think is is what what i'm looking for you're you're the you're like uh bodhi from um, <laughs> uh you know you're, you're looking right. for the ride man you're looking for the i am ride. dude that is a great way to freaking <laughs> say it man i, I know dude the ride because I, literally the my buddy i was talking to last night we were talking about it and i was like i don't know i was like just the past several years it was part of why i started doing jujitsu too i love grappling but it was more of like how it makes me feel connected to my body like mm -hmm. in a way that I've, I've not felt connected to my body before. Right. But it's yeah. capabilities. Like it's the nuances of how it feels. I was like, I'm looking for that same thing. And bow hunting always kind of gave me that. Cause it was primitive. It was primal, mm -hmm. right? You're very mm -hmm. close. You're up, up close and personal. You got to really know your, your, your enemy, if you will, what, right. Really yeah. well to get the job mm -hmm. done. And, and now once I kind of had that experience with my body in jujitsu, I was like, how do I take that same type of experience and how do I, like get that type of intensity and connection and like elevate it even more. Right. Right. How yeah. do I, how do I make this like part of my soul? I was like, well, yeah. we'll make it part make it an extension of me, make it even yeah. more intimate as, as yeah. an intimate as possible. Right. So that really was like the chase for me, man. It's like, that's a great way to say it, man. I'm, I'm chasing that, that ultimate ride, right? That I'm gonna chase the 50, the 50 year storm, dude. <laughs> yeah, hell's, uh, bells. What's that? Bell's beach or uh, uh, bells. Yeah, I think it's Bell's Beach think or something Bell's in Australia. Beach. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna see you there handcuffed uh yeah, handcuffed to some uh uh FBI agent. <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, what happened to Clint, man? He just flew too close to the sun, dude. <laughs> great 50 year storm, bro. <laughs> hey man, uh great conversation today. I appreciate your time. Thanks for hopping on, man. You bet, brother. Thanks for having me.